Good morning. It's such a beautiful day today, and it really is summer. And we can't complain when we're in Sydney yesterday, and it was 33 degrees in our car, so <laughs> we need to be positive. Now, um, Jordan is still away on uh, his short holiday, and it's too bad because I have a knock-knock joke that's going to beat his. So, three 90-year-old guys, they were brothers, 92, 94, and 96, lived in a house. The 96-year-old went upstairs to go have a bath. He got the water in and everything, went to put his toe in, and he couldn't remember, did he, does he need to go in the bath, or has he already had one? So he yells downstairs to his brothers, guys, come and help me. I'm not sure if I've had a bath or not. The 94-year-old said, I'm on my way. He goes up the stairs, he gets halfway, and he yells down to his other brother sitting at the coffee table, help, I can't remember if I'm going up the stairs or going down the stairs. The 92-year-old, or 6-year-old sitting at the table says, oh, I'm so glad that I'm not that forgetful. <laughs> Knock on wood. He says, I'll be up to help the two of you in a moment. I just got to answer the door. <laughs> it just came across my Facebook right after that Jordan thought he'd done the best one in the world, and that one came up. Okay, so today uh, we have the connection cards. If you're new, we'd like you to fill one in. Uh, they're at, right at the back as you came in on that little table. Sandy and Mike, this is uh, their last Sunday today, and we have a cake to celebrate um, for having them here, and we just wish you Godspeed, and thankful that you chose our church to fellowship with. They are heading back to Ontario. The Opals are also leaving, and they brought a cake today for you as well. And they're leaving in a couple of weeks. We'll say more about that later. On Thursday at the church here from 1.30 to 3 is tea and social time, uh, men and women, and it's a great time. I look forward to every second Thursday here at the church. Come on out. And we need volunteers to watch the kids over the summer months, and you can sign up at the Yes Wall at the back. I've been teaching Sunday school this past year, and last week was my last one, and then summer break, but I'll probably take, a, take one or something if they're short. But I had 15 of the best kids ever in my class. It was amazing to think, you know, at the beginning of it, I had three were my grandsons, and now there's 15, and um, thank you, parents, for bringing out your kids. In the bulletin, it has again about the hymn sing, and I was just told that it's canceled for the summer. Thank you.
It's funny, after having all that season of cold weather, it was really hot yesterday, and I was saying, it's too hot, and then I had to bite my tongue. It's uh, great to be with you guys this morning. Um, some sermons we have are a little more theologic in nature. Pastor Tim walked us through the names of God, um, and that was some pretty hardcore theology. Today's sermon is a little more practical in nature, and uh, we're going to pick up from where Pastor Jordan left off last week on how do we be the church. And we're going to talk about what it means to be a gospel-centered church. So my brother and brother-in-law and his wife, uh, my sister, um, were over a couple of weeks ago, and he said something which really caught me by surprise. He said he read a survey um, where the church is one of the lowest trusted institutions in society today. Well, I, that can't be true. And I looked it up, and it is. About a third of Americans trust the church which means two-thirds of Americans don't trust the church. I thought, well, that's Americans. It's got to be different in Canada. We have a better reputation. I looked it up, and that's not true either. So in 2022, Gallup did a survey. We don't always have good survey data, but they did a survey. And the two most committed religions, evangelical Christianity and Islam, are now reported as more damaging than beneficial to society in Canada. And evangelical Christianity, this is their quote, which encompasses dozens of denominations like Baptist, Pentecostal, and Mennonite, and characterized by its piety, was the only religion seen as more damaging than beneficial than any other self-identified religious group. And what's really interesting is minority religions, Sikhism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, continue to thrive, while Christianity is perceived negatively in the press in the media, in the movies, how do we end up here? I mean, that's the lowest level of trust in the church since they started recording this data in the 70s. And it's really not that hard to figure out, right? You think about news associated with the ecclesia, right? That's the word we use for the church universal. Unmarked school graves in Canada. Churches and pastors publicly align themselves with political parties in the U.S. or Canada. Pastoral scandal after pastoral scandal after pastoral scandal. Church after church being shut down. Pastors screaming at police officers, calling them Nazis. 
maybe it's not that hard to figure out why Canadians don't trust the church. And it even goes beyond to how we're seen by society. It's how we speak to and treat each other even within the church. People have joined and left churches because of vaccination. They've joined and left churches because lack of community. They refuse to speak to each other because of a person's position on divorce or human sexuality or church governance. And I want to be really clear, those are really important topics for the church to wrestle with. Right? We're not going to do that today. I'm not going to advocate. Rather, I'm going to talk about how we speak to each other and how we treat each other is as indicative of God's work in our lives as actually knowing Scripture. Well, if that's how we're viewed by the outside world, if that's how we treat each other inside the church, how do we get back to where we should be, right? This trusted authority, a lantern on the hill speaking to the ills of society, speaking into the lives of non-Christians and Christians alike, and living out what it means to have a life in Jesus. And how do we be the church in our personal relationships with each other? Well, good news, the church has been here before. And the New Testament is full of advice to the New Testament churches in a world torn apart politically and societally. And we can use the instruction of the gospel to help us today. Before we're going to do that, let's just pray and spend some time before God. Lord, we come to you this morning um, in in an unbelievably polarized world. And we just pray that today that the words we hear are not mine, but they're yours. um, That we can listen to your heart and your love for the church, your heart for your love for us. Um, And then we can comb through Scripture and understand what it means to us today. Continue to bless us. Continue to let us worship together throughout this service today. In your name we pray. Amen. So last week, Pastor Jordan preached on being a learning church, a worshiping church, and an evangelizing church. And we're going to expand that by continuing our series on being the church And we're going to talk about our need to be a gospel-centered church, how we need to be in a gospel-centered church, and how we need to be a gospel-centered people. And to do that, we're going to look at the book of Colossians. We're going to start with Colossians 3, verse 12 to 17. It's going to be the screen behind me. Um, I'm going to read from the CSB version. I think they have it as ESV up above. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. And just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. And above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts. And be thankful Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, when you read the book of Colossians, that seems a little bit weird to sort of throw in there. I mean, it seems kind of common sense, right? Be loving to one another, Give thanks to God in everything. And why would Paul write that in a letter to Colossians? So the church leader, Epaphras, had traveled from Colossae to see Paul while he was in prison in Rome. And that visit prompted Paul's letter to the church. So the church in Colossae, around 60-61 AD, was undergoing a big theologic attack. And we don't know all the details of the theological split, but we know some of the things that Paul addressed in the letter. Some members of the church wanted to bring back more of the Judaic rituals, the ceremonies of the law of Moses. And you remember the sacrificial system and salvation through works, right, sacrificing, was rendered obsolete by the death of Jesus. That's a kind of a big deal. The church needed to remember that we have salvation through faith and through faith alone. Some members of the church wanted to worship angels, and that violates God's specific command to worship him and him alone. And finally, and this may be the most important part, members wanted to limit the greatness and authority of Jesus Christ. So remember how Pastor Tim talked about Jesus being part of the Trinity? And and the Trinity thing is sometimes hard to wrap our heads around. But when on earth Jesus was fully human and fully divine, we cannot limit his authority and greatness because he's also God. 
So that's the background. In the letter, Paul addresses those issues to the church in Colossae and clarifies what the gospel and the authority of Christ means. He's addressing heresy, but then he also has to tell the members how to deal with each other. It sounds a lot like today to me. We have churches all over the world talking about a gospel, a lifestyle, or whatever that's not in keeping with Scripture. And just like the church in Colossae had a significant theological problem, the church in North America has that same issue. So that leads us to our first point, being a gospel-centered church. Now, if you look at church websites, and I've had to look at a lot, and I'll explain why in a minute, you find them filled with all sorts of really wonderful phrases, loving each other and accepting each other, taking you where you are, and all of those are necessary, and they're important. So pre-pandemic, if I was traveling on a weekend, I tried not to, but if I was, I tried to find a church where to worship, and the only way to find out is you start combing through church websites, and you start reading them, and you try to figure out where do they sit in terms of the gospel, and I don't mean you know, prosperity theology, or there are many ways to heaven theology, or there's no sin or no hell theology. I mean, to be a gospel-centered uh, church, it really starts with preaching. That sounds simple, doesn't it? I mean, what church doesn't do that? I mean, we're blessed to have Pastor Tim, who faithfully preaches the gospel, a gospel that calls us from our natural sinfulness to a place where we're right relationship with Jesus. As a church, we not only hold to the authenticity of Scripture, but the inerrancy of Scripture. And that means that the Bible, while written so long ago, it speaks to us equally today as it did to the church in Colossae. So when we uh, came to the island, now about a decade ago from Alberta, we visited a lot of churches. And even interesting here in the island, we have churches that don't hold to the authority of Scripture, or churches that add their own little spin on the gospel, or churches that preach the gospel but are cold. That's not a gospel-centered church. Being a gospel-centered church means that Pastor Tim, or whoever's preaching, not only references Scripture we preach, but we provide the context for Scripture. It's all too easy for most of us, myself included, to drag a verse or two out of context and make it say whatever we want to. My son has the wrong haircut. I'm sure there's a Deuteronomy verse on there somewhere. You have a tattoo. I'm positive there's a Scripture verse on that. And we're doing this on Sunday? Can't do that. Nowadays, we can call it Pastor Google, find the text you want, throw it down like a grenade, I win. That's not what a gospel-centered person looks like, nor what a gospel-centered church looks like. And it's actually theological. So Pastor Jordan talked about this last week, Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, the devil loves it when we proof text, right? When we just find a verse and throw it down. And I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but let's stay with a gospel-centered church if we could. Because part of it, to prevent spiritual drift, the pastors need our help, right? They're human just like us, and they need our support, our prayers and accountability. Pastor Tim needs us to pray for him. And that means every time that we pray, we should be praying for the leaders of the church. He needs to be surrounded by elders who can help him or hold him accountable. And if you look at church blow-ups over the past few years, there's one thing they hold in common. The pastor or the leadership weren't accountable for their words or their actions. And over time, we have spiritual drift. And fortunately here, right, as you know, we have a pastor, we have elders, and we have a leadership team that are accountable for running the church. I'm very, very thankful for that. God also calls us to pray for our leaders, and I mentioned that. We need to pray for their hearts. Pray for wisdom in making good decisions according to God's leading, and praying that the preaching and the decisions that they make have a positive impact on us, on our families, and our schools, and our governments. I'm going to flip from Colossians to 1 Timothy 2 for a second because he addresses this very clearly. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and are all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So to be the church means that we need to be a gospel-centered church, a church where the totality of Scripture is preached, where you and I understand not only the words, but the context of Scripture, where we can see a pastor supported and held accountable, and where you and I Pray for him and the leaders continuously. 
Let's talk what it means to be in a church like that. To be the church, we need to be in a gospel-centered church. So the pandemic has done a lot of really cool things, if you think about it. Good and bad, but some cool things. So, for example, for the first time in the history of the church, we have the ability to reach anyone in the globe at any time on any day. We stream our services like we're doing today, and anyone can watch from any location. No matter where you live, you can hear the gospel. I was on the road last week, and I was able to join in and listen to Pastor uh, Jordan speak. It's kind of amazing technology, is it? And the bad thing about the pandemic is that we can stream our services, and anyone can watch from any location. And while this was crucial during the pandemic, it means that as churches have opened up, wow, this is super cool. I completely lost my sermon. Yeah, awesome. Here we go. We're back. Whew. As the churches opened up, um, people were able to watch the sermons wherever they wanted to. I'm almost there. Bear with me. Here we go. Across North America, as the pandemic is coming to a close, people aren't coming back to church. And that's not unusual to, let's say, friendship. That's not unusual to the island. When I talk to my family members or pastors that I talk to, they have the same problem right across North America. People are just not coming back to church. And it would be one thing to say that people are generally watching the services live and they're in community with us, but that's not true. We've reduced the importance of hearing the gospel in community to one of hearing the gospel in convenience. I'm going to say that again. We've reduced the importance of hearing the gospel in community to one of hearing the gospel in inconvenience. You know, the New Testament church was never envisioned where, as one where Paul's letter would end up in a church and somebody would get the letter and they would read it at their home on a Tuesday and then they would pass it off to a, a friend's house and they would read it on, a, I don't know, a Saturday and they would pass it off to a friend's house and they sort of forgot and they got busy that week and oh yeah, 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 I'll read the letter. That's not how it worked. The New Testament church was one where we gathered together and actually more than once a week, but they gathered together continuously, worshipped together, grew together, ate together, impacted the community together. They did life together. And somehow, in the overwhelming surge of the pandemic, we've lost the importance of gathering together. We need to commit to hearing the gospel again in community. And we've committed to giving grace and giving space here at Friendship, right? If you want to wear a mask, go ahead. If you want to bump elbows, not shake hands, no problem. If you don't want to wear a mask, that's fine too. We will give grace and we will give space to you, but we want the ability to do that in community. So if you're online today and you're worshiping with us from far away and we have that ability, we know people worship from more than just the, the peninsula, you can join our community, put a comment on the YouTube feed. We'd love to hear from you and to help you in any way that we can. And friends, if you have someone who's not coming to church and you want to ease them in church, you, watching online is a great way to do that. But if you're online today and you're worshiping from the peninsula, we want you to come back. Come back. We'll find a way for you to be here and feel safe. We'll find a way for you to be here and feel accepted. We'll find a way for you to be here and to grow with us in community. We want to be like the New Testament church, where we gather together, where we worship together, where we grow together, where we eat together, where we impact the community together. To be the church means that we need to be in a gospel-centered church. And finally, to be the church means we need to be a gospel-centered people. I'm going to park here for a little bit. I know I've touched on this in terms of how we need to be in the scriptures and how we need to walk away from proof texting and how we need to stop using Pastor Google. We need to hit just a little bit deeper. The Baptist General Conference has seven essentials of a Baptist church, and I'm going to look at just one of them. We believe that not only Christ's people are bound together as brothers and sisters, but we're called to care for one another to serve God together. We know we're called to support one another, including benevolence, right? That's where our tithing goes. We know we're called to support each other through the work of the church, and that's what our volunteering does in many different ways, and that sounds good. We'll care for each other. We'll support each other. It sounds like our job's done. I want to talk about something that I referred to at the beginning, how we relate to each other, how we are called to care for one another as we serve God together. So let's go back to Colossians 3 for a second. Remember he was dealing with a theological attack and then spent a whole portion of his letter talking about how we deal with each other. He tells us to bear with one another, to forgive one another, 
and let the peace of Christ rule our hearts. And what have we seen during the pandemic? We're a society that's pretty much polarized over everything. I've had to step away from basically almost all social media other than creeping and following my grandkids on Facebook. But um, the vitriol we see online is unbelievable. And, and that's not relegated just to non-Christians. We see it constantly online from fellow brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter whether you agree with what was posted or not. We're far too easy, far too quick to jump on a keyboard and engage with attacks. That's basically what was happening with the church in Colossae. In the midst of their theological problems, they had forgotten God's call for their lives and how they treat each other. And so Paul deliberately points that out, how we're called to live with each other. We'll get it thrown on screen. We're going to read the same passage again. But think of it in the context of how they're treating each other. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. And just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Instead of unfriending each other and proof texting, we're called to put on love. Put on love. And that applies to me. i got to be honest, I'm way too easy to want to bring down the thunder, to be a prophet in the wilderness, to call people to account because I'm always right and they're always wrong. Oh, to be so righteous. We have another example in Scripture I want to bring our minds to. What did Jesus do for the woman at the well in John 4? I'm not going to read that passage, but it's actually the longest recorded encounter with Jesus in the book of John. And that means it's really important for us to think about and to study from and to learn from. Jesus meets her at the well on her own. So what's the background for John 4? We don't know her name. But we know she was a Samaritan female on her own. She was a social outcast, even by Samaritan standards. You see, at that time, women at the well drew water in groups. It's like going out for coffee with your girlfriends. And the fact that she's alone means she's an outcast. We know she had five husbands, and the man she was currently with was not her husband. So let's add that up. Samaritan, right? Jews don't hang out with Samaritans. Female in that culture. Men don't equate females and males equally. On man number six and an outcast from our own society. And how does Jesus treat her? How does he treat us? Jesus offers her love. Jesus offers her salvation. Jesus tells her he is the Messiah. Jesus offers us love. Jesus offers us salvation. Jesus tells us he is the Messiah. Paul knows this, and so he closes out the letter to the church at Colossae with these words from Colossians 4, 5-6. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you know how to answer each person. Friends, the trouble we see in the church today isn't actually a whole lot different than the trouble in the New Testament church. Theological problems, society problems, interpersonal problems. For us, for you and I, Right? We need to be, we need to commit to being a gospel-centered church. We need to commit to being in a gospel-centered church. And we need to commit to being a gospel-centered people. Now, if you need prayer over any of these items, the elders will be at the front of the church to pray with you. And if you need to reconcile with somebody, do it today. Jesus wasted no time with the woman at the well offering salvation to her. And we should waste no time repenting to others. So as I close out and pray, I'm going to call Johnny to come up to worship with us. We're going to close with the ironic blessing. You've heard the song, also called the Burkat Kohanim, the lifting of hands. In the life of the Jewish synagogue, it's the most uplifting moment where the congregation participates in kind of a, as it's been described, kind of a divine hug. And the good news is we don't need the rabbis or priests to do this anymore. That was removed by Jesus' sacrifice. We could sing it together and bless one another. 
So before we do that, let's just pray together, and then we'll rise and sing this last song. Lord, we just confess um, that the world is full of sin, that we're full of sin. And amazingly enough, despite all of that, um, you forgive us and you love us. We pray for forgiveness for our arrogance, um, our willingness to fight too easily, to put people down too easily, to not respond with love and with kindness and with words that are laden with salt. Um, Lord, we thank you for salvation, and we just pray that you would continue to forgive us, that we would continue to turn to you, and we would continue to be people seen as an authority in this world. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for your blessing on us. And we just pray that as we sing together, um, you would just continue to work in our hearts and soften us. In your name we pray. Amen. His favor.
Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you know how to answer each person. If you need time with the elders, they're up front here to pray with you. We have cake and coffee. We can be in community and eat together. Eat lots, I would imagine, because there's two cakes. Have a great, great Sunday. Have a great week. It's Canada Day this week. Have a wonderful time with your family. God's blessings.